So welcome everybody to this panel with Nadia Colburn and writers.com. I say the sky, poetry, mindfulness, and the power of deep listening. So I'm just gonna quickly introduce our presenter, Nadia Colburn, and then I'm gonna hand it over to her. Nadia Colburn holds a PhD in English from Columbia University. She is a certified Kundalini yoga teacher and an order of interbeing aspirant, I hope I'm saying that right, in Thich Nhat Hanh's Plum Village tradition. Nadia's writing has won numerous awards, including a pen slash any discovery award in poetry. Her debut poetry collection, The High Shelf, was published in 2019 with the WordWorks Press. And her second book, I Say the Sky, was published by the University Press of Kentucky's New Poetry and Prose Series. Nadia's poems and creative nonfiction have been widely published in more than 70 national publications, including The New Yorker, American Poetry Review, Spirituality and Health, Lions Roar, Truthout, Slate.com, American Scholar, and many other places. Nadia is a founding editor at the Spirituality and Social Justice magazine Anchor, published by Still Harbor, and a research scholar at the Ronin Institute. She is passionate about helping students and clients uncover the, their full stories and unlock the power of their creative voice. Learn more about Nadia at her website, nadiacolburn.com. So Nadia, thank you so much for joining us. Wonderful to see you and please take it away. I will unmute myself. Thank you so much, Fred. I'm really glad to be here with you. Um, and thank you all for being here. This is the official publication date of I Say the Sky. Um, and even though it is, it was out early in some places and it's still coming in other parts of the world, but um, this is a big day. And yeah, I'm really glad to partner with writers.com. And I'm also, as many of you know, the founder of the Align Your Story Writing School, where I also offer uh, creative writing um, classes. But let me, um, and I'm here in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So I thought I would just dive right in and um, I'm going to be reading some poems. I'm going to be talking about them and talking about the book and then talking about the relationship between mindfulness, poetry, deep listening, giving a little bit of my own journey. And then there'll be time in the middle where I'm going to offer a meditation and writing prompt and then time at the end for questions and answers. So. If you've worked with me before, you know that I like to start always with um, just a moment of coming into our center. I'll ring the singing bowl so that we can really be here, be present together for this hour that we have together, which again, I'm so feeling really lucky to get to share with you. So come to a comfortable seated position. Maybe put your hand on your heart. and allow yourself to receive, receive this time, be present, see what arises for you, what doors might open, what new questions might be asked. Allow your body to settle. So again, thank you for being here. Um, so I thought I would start by reading a poem from the book. This is actually the third poem in the book. And the occasion for the poem was the um, kind of illness into death of my husband's stepfather's mother. So basically my husband's grandmother um, that we were very close with and we spent a lot of time with her and it happens that she was an Auschwitz survivor um, and that just is part of her story. I'm, I'm very aware that as we're talking there's there are people dying in Gaza um, all around the world. There are people, species facing unjust death, extinction and part of the project I think of this book was how to meet those places of struggle in my own personal life and what are the intersections between my personal life 
and history, um, human species, other species, and how can we also move through transitions into uh, living more fully and being fully present. So I will read the poem and I see hands. So what I'm gonna do is I'm going to have time for questions at the end. So please write your questions down so that um, you remember them at the end, we come to them at the end. Smaller even than last week, for Ruth. She sits in her wheelchair huddled over the oxygen that is pumped through a paper cup up in the direction of her nose as she struggles for breath, ready or not for the great transition. Her son greets us with jokes, asks about our New Year's resolutions, about whether we saw the new store on the road before we turned off to the nursing home. She opens her eyes, grunts, tells him to stop. This is important work. We get up, put Mozart's flute concerto on the old boom box and do not talk. I don't know if this is the proper material for a poem, the almost death of an old lady I have almost come to love. Why not? Why hesitate? And why call what I feel for her almost love? What stone in my heart prevents me from giving myself completely? At night when we are home, I think of her beautiful face, her eyelids always elegant, her smile at my daughter the same as it has always been. I think of her desire to protect the young, her mother dying when she was 10 and the Nazis soon to take over Hanover, she and her sister surviving only because they were twins. Protection, what she did not get, what she could not entirely give, her own children, the suffering seeping out. This is not a poem about escape. The great transition is not an escape, but a turn in which we meet the self we may not want to meet. And then what happens? Last year at almost the same time, our friend's heart stopped for a moment. Two months later, she saw shadows. They're coming, she said, terrified, fighting against them with all her force as I sat on her bed, the dark approaching, but nothing, not even her own 10-year-old twins could keep her fastened to this life. Darling, forgive me. Forgive me for what? I want so badly to live, sometimes I forget that I am alive, that this is enough, even the fear, the regrets that we have each other, our children, this moment, that everything is a part, even this difficult dance, the body getting smaller, thinner, the lips getting chapped, dried out, the heart getting ready to stop. Put the music on, praise the sky and the stones that also breathe into this moment, now, and then something else. So I thought what I would do tonight is give you a little kind of tour of the book, um, how I put it together, the journey that I take in it. And in some ways it's a journey to, to mindfulness and to a meditation practice and, and to what we'll be doing together. So to back up, when I was a child, my father read poetry to me. And um, I particularly remember his reading Hopkins, which I didn't understand. I had no idea what the poems were about, but I loved them and I loved the music of them. So I think that instilled in me a practice of listening um, that was beyond like the intellectual mind understanding, but some process of listening and connection to, to language, but also to music and to the body. And then I fell in love with poetry again in college when I took a Whitman seminar and I went on to graduate school to study poetry. I thought I would be a professor um, in a traditional English department teaching poetry as a way to keep poetry alive. But somewhere in there, I started to want to write my own poetry and really prioritize that. So I moved up to Cambridge where I still live to study with the poet Jory Graham, whose work I really loved. And um, she was and is an inspiring teacher. 
And what she instructed us to do in her classes was to pay attention to our bodies and to pay attention to the world around us. And she had been trained as a method actor. And so she brought that into her teaching of poetry to write from experiences. And that was really what I was looking for. <laughs> it wasn't a coincidence that I found that because, um, you know, I went searching for Jory's teachings. And um, I was partly writing because the experience of becoming a mother had woken me up to my body and woken me up to these other ways of listening that were, you know, I was in graduate school. Um, I've talked about this before, if you've worked with me before, but in graduate school studying poetry, and it was very analytical, very much like from the analytical mind and then being pregnant and then having a baby, a little other body um, woke me up to this whole other way of, of listening to the world around us. So I thought I would share that uh, one of the poems about, about birth um, with you here, because even though this is predates a serious meditation practice, I feel like that experience um, of of giving birth, of, of having a baby, of being a mother, actually connected me to later on this meditation practice, which is so much about going beyond the analytical, analytical mind. So here's the poem. The Physical World. For nine months, I anticipated as the other end of pain, a revelation, a world turned inside out, the sure logic of arithmetic undone. Each inch I grew marked a failure and a promise, my present physical certainty, my approaching release. But instead, torn open, I gave birth to the end of ideas. Beyond pain was born no understanding. Beyond understanding was re revealed no new way of knowing, new sight, but another body, robust, which no thought set screaming, purple-faced, infuriated at air, or moved closer to my breast, or closed its thinly lidded round brown eyes, so soon worn out by the unfamiliar light. So the way I've kind of structured the book is the first section is kind of looking at the world around me and then coming into my own body, my own experiences more. And in that process of doing that, of listening to my body, um, of paying attention, I confronted early childhood trauma that I hadn't really dealt with before. And that is in this middle section of this book. Um, and the poems are relatively gentle. I didn't want to write a narrative book. I wanted to write a book that had a kind of bigger scope um, and that was not gonna get stuck there, that was gonna move through it. So I'm gonna read for you um, the last poem in that section. It's somewhat direct. <laughs> um, no, but not triggering direct, I don't think. So no, I can't know as in K-N-O-W. I carry with me a small stone. I know what it is to be touched as a thing. Small stone with no name. I spit you out of my mouth, back into the ground. My body is my own body. I survive. So in this process of kind of self-encounter, which I think the book is about, and which for me, lyric poetry is very much about. Um, I felt like I needed to come to something in the encounter with the self was a letting go of the self into a larger, a larger perspective, a larger container, a larger understanding of what self is. Um, and this is 
also, I think, you know, when we have a crisis that turn to the spiritual, but also what we learn when we have any really spiritual practice or a meditation practice is that there's the small self and then there's that kind of large self. There's, or as Thich Nhat Hanh says, there's the water and there's the wave and they inter are. Um, and I think that mm, a lot of this book is about that process of interconnection, of moving between different forms and finding that lyric moment in all these different forms where the self is both recognized and dissolving into something greater. So I thought maybe what I would do now is lead you in a little meditation because I could talk about this for a really long time, but I want this to be interactive so um, and experiential also. So I will lead you in a short meditation and then give you a prompt and read you a poem from the book and give you a prompt and give you time to write. So my experience with the meditation is that, um, and with my practice, what I want to, what I want to get to before I, before we do that though, is that all of this is leading to the kind of journey, um, not only through the self, but also in my own poetic practice to get from, okay, I'm going to think through this poem, right? I had this analytical training to, I'm going to feel it in my body to, I think that next step, which is I'm going to get out of my own way and see what wants to come through me. So if Jory kind of taught me how to pay attention to the senses, to what was happening in the body, I think for me, my own personal evolution was then to say, okay, what if I now step back from that and see what else wants to emerge, kind of what wants to come through me, not get stuck so much in the, even in the sensory details. I don't know if that makes sense, but I, my experience of, um, my experience of meditating is that, and then putting the meditation and the writing together is that when I sit in the silence, then there is a way in which the language is no longer just mine. It is um, like I'm able to tap into um, almost like a storehouse of, of language, of images, of um, experiences that the poem then comes, comes through. Anyway, um, that's all very abstract, but what I would love is, as I said, to lead you in a little meditation and, um, and let you have an experience yourself. So take a nice, long, deep breath, put your hand on your heart. We'll just do silent breath meditation. If you're new to meditation, you might want to count. So counting in for a breath of four and counting out for a breath of four. If you have more experience, follow the breath. If the mind wanders, bring it back to the breath.
I'm going to read you a poem. It's called March. I'm having a hard time pulling it up for some reason. Okay. March. All winter we walked on the fallen sky, walked on clouds until we fell thigh deep to earth. Now the clouds are running down the side of the mountain in small hidden rivers. What in you needs melting? What do you do with your anger and your hope? All night down the side of the mountain, waters run together where we cannot see. Underneath, the earth is awakening. Once more, the tips of bare branches put out new buds. Again, they clasp their small palms together in prayer. So my invitation to you is to write, answering the question in some way, whatever way you want, what in you needs melting? And then I like to give some words to use. You can use all of these words, you can use none of them, just to get you out of your traditional way of responding to things. So the words are fallen, mountain, awakening, branches, anger, and small. I'll put that in the chat. I just want to remind you to stay connected to your body as you write.
take one more minute here and we'll come back together. Maybe you will want to go back to that later. I wanted to lead you in another little meditation and another prompt, and then I'll read two very short poems and then open it up to your questions and comments. So let's come back into a short meditation. This will be a little shorter, both of them. Let's do the box breath together. I'm feeling drawn to do that. So we're going to count in for a count of four. We're going to breathe in for a count of four as if you're going up a wall. Hold it on the top for a count of four. Go down for a count of four and then across the floor for a count of four. So you're kind of making a box. This is very regulating, really helps balance the body, the mind and become sharper. So more keen. So let's do that together. So in for a count of four. Hold for a count of four. Down the next wall for a count of four. And then hold at the bottom, cross the floor for a count of four. And go at your own pace. Come back to natural breath and just let my words kind of fall through you. Thich Nhat Hanh talks about letting words just fall through you like rain. And in the last poem, March, I was really inspired by Thich Nhat Hanh who talks about drinking a cloud and how the cloud gets transformed into the water that we drink. And in March, we were kind of walking on the cloud that fall as snow when it snowed here today. So that process of interbeing of all the connection between the different forms of matter, the forms of life that we, that we become more and more aware of as we sit in meditation, as we pay attention, and that as poets we are aware of also. Of course, Ovid's Metamorphosis um, is all about that process of transformation. So I'm gonna read you a short poem again, just to hear it, receive it, and then I'll give you a prompt. Onion. Wrapped in your own paper thin gold, your roots shoot upward, earthward. Sorry, let me start over. Onion. Wrapped in your own paper thin gold, your roots shoot earthward, your top stretches to the sun. Bulb, full as birdsong. So my prompt is to look around you wherever you are right now and find something and describe it just a little bit. Be detailed and how is it connected to something else? 
and have a good time with it. We'll just have a few moments here. Just take one more minute and you can work on it more later. I want to end with reading two more really short poems and then um, a little tiny bit from the end of the book and then I want to open it up to hear from you all. Um, so and there will be a recording of this um, so you can you can listen to the recording. Okay, this poem is called the end of history and it's actually from the first section of the book. The end of history. And I want to say I'm reading this poem because for me, the, the journey of the book is, an, a journey, is a journey both to meet myself, which I've talked about. It's a journey of coming to different 
kind of circles, different ways of listening, but it's also a journey towards acceptance. Um, and I, I want to just talk a little bit later about how acceptance does not mean passivity. Um, but this is a poem for me about this moment. History, the end of history. History, I say, with its high ramparts, its engraved swords. I say the bees are falling from the skies. The apples will not come into bloom this year or next. The fish gorge themselves on plastic. Or I say the sky is blue today with nimbus clouds. I say the girl, her clothes whipped off underneath the guard's heavy weight is named Deborah. I say the child frozen at his mother's breast has stopped his cries. We must do something. I say the hawk sits in the high branches. I say the mother sits on the cold cement floor. I say yesterday I was full of fear and today, and today the sky is blue with nimbus clouds. We must act quickly. The world loves itself, falls into itself with open arms, devoured, devouring. And this is the last poem of the book. You, you who were so quiet, didn't you know there was a symphony inside of you? Didn't you know you were composing? The trumpets are so glad and the French horn in its great deep beckoning resounds. Didn't you hear the calling from your stillness as if you had looked out over calm waters to see the geese rise up in unison in front of the setting sun? Such a squall of color and your whole being given to the one who rests in the great upflapping, the geese mounting higher and higher into the evening, growing brighter and louder still so i said i was going to read from the end of the book but in the interest of time i'm not going to i have a little postscript and what i wanted just i'll just paraphrase part of it which is that that acceptance um i feel is necessary not to just kind of sit back and be passive but actually to take action so my hope is that our engagement with poetry with art is both a place of coming into meeting the self um, coming into acceptance but then also a springing off board for other forms of action and um, on my website and my free resource center i have for example a whole list of ways to have really like tangible actions around the climate change I'm putting together, um, like including ways to reach politicians and companies, kind of systemic change. I'm putting together a list of resources for um, trauma survivors, um, other ways to get involved in different kinds of actions so that that lyric moment is both that encounter with the self, but that we take that out into encounters with others because for me we all inter are and um and and our writing of poetry is connected to our our living in every other area of our life as well so that is my little presentation for you all um i hope you enjoy the book i hope if you haven't bought a copy you'll get one um yeah i i hope you enjoy it if you have it and um i would love to hear i'm going to put links in the chat um that might be helpful um and i would love to hear from you all so if you have any questions please ask them and i guess what i want to say also is that if you um starting tomorrow but then ongoing after that but as a community starting tomorrow i am offering a meditation a seven day meditation and writing challenge and that's going to be free for everyone who buys a copy of my book um, it's a way to kind of go deeper into the experience of the poems but also have that personal journey yourself into some of the questions that the poem asks um, so if you buy a copy of my book make sure you go to my website um, and sign up so that you get the uh, free challenge. I can probably, I'll put that in the chat for you also. Um, I don't know, Katie, if you're here, maybe you could even put that 
in that link in the chat. Um, but I want to hear questions. So does anyone want to, um, how do you ask your, Lindsay, why don't you just ask a question in the chat? Um, and, and then if you have, if you don't, oh, I see a question, Jay, um, I'd love to hear your question. Can you unmute yourself? No. Yes. No. <laughs> Ask to unmute. There we go. Um, I, I have two quick questions. One is, could you say more about Anchor? And um, second, um, assuming it, it did, how did your poetry, either in terms of form or content, change once you started a regular meditation practice? Yeah, those are great questions. First of all, Anchor, I'm sadly, I think that my bio with um, writers.com is a little outdated. Uh, it was alive and going when I started working with you, but it's now they're just back issues. But it was a really, really beautiful magazine um, at the intersection of spirituality and social justice. Um, and if you want, send me an email and I can send you the link to get the back issues because we had a lot of great articles um, and also visual art. But um, in terms of my practice and my poetry, how has it changed? If you, um, I would say that before my poetry was, it was definitely, if any of you have looked at my first book, it's quite different from my second book. And my first book, though it only came out a few years ago, those poems are much older. Um, many of them are older. And mm, I would say that my poems were more uh, obscure and um, I would, um, they're maybe a little bit more kind of thinky than the, the poems that I've written once I have a deep meditation practice. That said, um, I think that in some ways my poetry practice was itself a form of meditation practice. So I have poems, I have a poem in this book that I wrote when I was 20. Um, I had a whole manuscript that was like this length of relatively new poems. And then I decided, you know what, I want to do something fun. I want to put in older poems. And most people have no idea what the older poems are and what the newer poems are. So I think that um, it was almost like I was channeling my meditation self through my poetry, but the process of writing the poems, I would say, is much more... Um, fluent now that I have a meditation practice. It feels much more like, as I said in the beginning, the poems are coming through me than that they're my poems in that, in, in a way. Um, Lindsay, I see you have a question. I want to publish a few poems in Amelis Review, a spiritual magazine. I want to share some of my light. Any suggestions how to put my foot forward in a positive way? I feel nervous suggestions or advice. So if you have a particular, you should do it, Lindsay. Um, if you have a particular uh, magazine that you want to be published in, I would say write a cover letter that makes it really clear. Would you like this magazine? You think you're a good fit? Um, send them poems that you think would be a good fit for that magazine. And, and then if you don't get accepted right away, keep on submitting. Submit to there, but submit other places as well. There's It's a number game. Um, and there are poems that I have published in super prestigious places that were rejected previously by really small magazines or other prestigious places. I think it's a little bit random. So I think don't get your hopes on being in one particular place. Submit widely, know where you're submitting, um, and make connections and, and, and believe in your own work. So um does anyone want to oh fred do you want to ask a question <laughs> yeah i do first of all i i absolutely loved all the poems you read they were so beautiful and i was going to write that so beautiful in the chat but i thought you probably know that so it's probably fine but um i really was very interested in what you said about you know initially kind of having like an analytical approach and then a more embodied approach. And then finally, something where it's more like flowing through you. And you mentioned that you feel like you're sort of accessing 
a kind of like place or storehouse that's somewhat sort of beyond that. And that actually lines up with my experience fairly well, not necessarily when I write poetry, but at other times. And I guess I'm wondering if you want to say any more about that. I, I, I don't want to necessarily put too many names on that, but it feels, I've been reading a lot of Carl Jung recently and it feels very related to that. And I, I wonder if, if that's some, you know, something you want to comment on. And lastly, what I find is that it feels like there's a kind of that there and then speech comes through, but I find that the speech is typically in my voice. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like there's a membrane and words are happening. And then the way they form into words is, is in my voice. So I almost feel like I'm being spoken to by others in, in my own voice. And I just wonder if that's similar to your experience or different. Yeah, I love that. Um, and it's, it's interesting. It's like almost like a, everything is kind of like a tantric practice, right? Like it has to come through the particular body that we have. It has to come through the particular language that we speak, you know, like we might be channeling, but I'm not going to like all of a sudden like, oh, I'm channeling Chinese. I don't speak Chinese, but look, a poem came. So um, that would be super cool if that happened, but I'd be yeah, very, <laughs> um, you know, I actually wrote my dissertation on poetic forms of authority and it really looked at this. And I had no idea why I, I was writing it. Like I didn't really have a very, by the time I was writing it, I, I had a deep write, poetry writing practice, but when I came up with the topic for my thesis, I didn't yet, but basically it looks at like, where do people think poetry comes from? And it looked back in like the middle ages, you know, people would have these dreams and there were all these dream poems. And then the romantic period, people kind of thought it came from like themselves, like the romantic self. And then in the kind of postmodern era um, with like language poetry, and I did a lot of work on John Ashbery, um, who it was like, I was talking about how it's like this idea of like language itself being a form of inspiration that we tap into. And it's only recently, like in the past, like very recently that, I, well, after I wrote that, then I started to feel more and more distance from that contemporary poetry that's accessing poetry through language. But I feel like I'm coming full circle and your comment helped me come full circle of like, yeah, language too is like this vast container. It's like a way to, get outside of the small self into this shared medium that we're all accessing and using in our poems. So I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that it's really interesting <laughs> to kind of, what, what, where does it come from? Um, Diana, hi. Can you unmute yourself? Okay. Perfect. I was trying, but it wasn't responding. Sorry. Yeah. yeah, I was clicking away. I wonder if the way that some of the meditation practice enters the product, the actual product of the poem, is partly in the ending. Because there's there's a lightness in your endings. They satisfy, they satisfy my taste, you know, they're, they're sort of, they sit well, but they also, the reason I'm asking if the meditation, if, if you suspect that meditation enters that part of your process is because they also let go. Hmm. Do you follow? I do follow and I hadn't yeah. thought of that before, but I love that. I love that as a suggestion. Like, and I do think that's also related to um like I I if I think about like Keats, he has this well wrought urn, and it's like everything like the poem wants to hold it, it wants to hold it's an urn, it wants to hold the ashes, it wants to last forever, it wants to be immortal, and it kind of doesn't let go. It's so well constructed. Exactly. But 
then we kind of open it up with a different tradition or like reading a lot of Rumi, for example, where his poems are like, wait, where, where, what are you saying? Huh? Like, but if they're just kind of inspired and they're almost like little Zen koans sometimes that the poem can be a little bit more open. Like, mm -hmm. I don't want to over workshop my poems because I want them to have like a little bit of lightness to them, like that letting go of. Exactly. That's yeah. exactly what is happening in the book. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so much for that observation and careful reading. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Sandra, the publisher is the University Press of Kentucky. Um, they have a series where um, you kind of just submit a manuscript and they choose one poetry book and one prose book in a kind of creative it, it the press publishes many books each year but they tend to be kind of um non-fiction books mostly um it's a university press but they have a series where they publish one contemporary poetry one contemporary prose book per year and they chose my book someone had suggested the press to me like i did i was looking i thought i might like to publish with the university press um so I was interested in them. I had done a little bit of research about it, but I just got lucky. And the editor who chose it, Lisa Williams, is a wonderful poet, and I felt really lucky to connect with her. Um, Becca, thank you so much for saying that the poems moved you. I really have um, hoped that my poems would touch people, not just here, but but here, um, you know, in the body, in the emotions. So thank you. Uh, other questions? I'd love to hear. Maybe, I guess it's um, seven fifty-eight. So maybe there's a maybe. there's a great question from Jesse that's somewhere up in the middle. So I'll just read it out to you if you like. Right. At the top of this presentation, you mentioned deep listening. I'm curious about how and why you use that term because I associate it with the work and teaching of the composer Paulina Oliveros. Are you familiar with her? And is that the way you're, and is the way you're using the term deep listening akin to how she did? I actually don't know her work. Um, I would love to take down that name and learn more about her. I take the term from um, primarily Thich Nhat Hanh, who talks so much about um, listening and the gift of listening. And um, I, he talks about deep listening. So, so that's where I'm coming from. And possibly, um, I don't know, I don't know Pauline Oliveros um, and we'll certainly look her up. Um, but possibly she's coming from a similar source or possibly not. But I, it's, it's nice to think about the um, connections uh, across, across genres and across traditions. Well, I think we're at 7.59. So this might be the perfect, perfect place to to end and um i'm gonna put just put those um question those links in the in the chat again so these are places you can buy the book and then also places to get my free resources um including that guide to um guide to climate change and also wait let me just do one more or katie if you're still here if you could also put that link to um thank you to my seven day new year practice which is free if you have a copy of the book and that's going to be a meditation and writing practice over seven days um and then you get to keep those recordings so each day i'll send a 15 minute recording and it will kind of take you on your own on your own experience is this okay <laughs> thank you um and so for everybody Again, thank you so much for being here. Nadia, thank you. Those poems are absolutely gorgeous. Um, thank you so much for sharing your, your wisdom with us about, about writing and about meditation. Thank you all. Thank you, Fred, and thank you, everybody. So for everybody, you can connect with Nadia. Um, she has an upcoming course. Uh, it's in early April. It's called Poetry as Sacred Attention. It's with writers.com. So I'm gonna put the link here in the chat and we're gonna send you all these links by email along with this recording. So you'll get it as well. But here's her course, Poetry is Sacred Attention. It's one of our absolute best courses. We're grateful to run it every time. 
And if you'd like to stay abreast of what we're doing poetry-wise, um, here is a link where you can go and you'll see a little sign-up form to join our poetry newsletter, which will also join you into our main writers.com newsletter. So we'll have all those links for you by email. And thank you so much for joining. Thank you for your wonderful questions. And Nadia, thank you again. Yeah, and I just want to say writers.com has so many wonderful classes. So, you know, look and see what they're doing. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good night, everybody. And um, if you have other, I'll just say one more thing. If you have other questions for me, um, reach out to me. My email is really simple. It's Nadia at NadiaColburn.com. So I love to hear from you and um, hope to stay in touch.